Today, Indian Muslims want a Suleh Kul in India. They want India which is pluralistic, India which is inclusive, India which allows everybody to practice their religion and accepts everybody's theological and moral virtue and worth. That is what Indian Muslims today want in India. And that is what Suleh Kul was was essentially about. So Akbar offered to Hindus what Muslims today want Narendra Modi and RSS and Hindu majority to offer to them. Uh, Gypsy Ghosh uh, and Gautam Ghosh for hosting this very interesting discussion on um, insightful Islam. Um, uh, in this day and age when we see some of the most ugly sentiments being expressed so publicly, uh, racism, uh, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, uh, even intolerance towards uh, Hinduism, so openly in the public, it is uh, r uh, really wonderful that you are hosting an event like this. Uh, and uh, while Canada is known for its multiculturalism, I just want to point out to our audience that India was a land of multiculturalism long before the West even discovered culture. So, so keep that in mind. We have been practicing multiculturalism for literally thousands of years in India. Uh, today, uh, it is very difficult to talk about uh, an enlightened or insightful Islam because uh, Islam without enlightenment, Islam without insight is not Islam. Uh, so it would be oxymoronic uh, to talk about it in that way. Nevertheless, there is a very beautiful verse in the Quran uh, which basically uh, says that God has extracted us uh, from darkness and brought us into enlightenment. يَخْرِجُوا مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ nur. And so it is important to understand that uh, Islam has always uh, presented itself as a, a commitment to and pursuit of enlightenment and insight uh, and the opposite of ignorance and jahiliya. So having said that, uh, I must also say that over a period of time many different kinds of Islam have manifested while many Muslims uh, for some reason that I don't understand want to insist that there is only one Islam. Uh, let me tell you that there is huge difference between the Islam that is manifest by the Taliban in Afghanistan and the Islam that is practiced by the Indonesians. <laughs> One is profoundly intolerant and the other is incredibly embracing uh, and all-encompassing. So there is a huge uh, spectrum of interpretations of Islam. Uh, so much so that the Quran itself recognizes it and the Quran says in chapter 18, uh, sorry, verse 18 of chapter 39, uh, that when you listen to the word of God, try to extract the most beautiful meaning from it, uh, clearly indicating that less than beautiful meanings can be extracted from the Quran itself. So, given what is happening in India, uh, the rise of intolerance, uh, religious conflict, uh, hatred, call for genocide, etc., I thought I will anchor my discussion uh, on uh, on Islam, uh, enlightened and manifestations of Islam in the context of India. And uh, can you see this slide? Yes, yes. 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 So I want to begin by saying that uh, traditionally Muslim scholars have divided the world into two or three different uh, arenas. The first is called uh, Darul Islam, a region where Islam is established, Islam is practiced, uh, and uh, some people define it even narrowly to say where Islamic law uh, is, uh, is essentially sovereign. However, uh, the, the traditional scholars basically said where societies which were generally understood as Islamic and governed by Muslim rulers were Darul Islam. And then those societies which were not Islamic or Muslim were seen as Darul Harb or the house of war. This is a very narrow, from a geopolitical perspective, understanding of the world. And then there were those who added a third category called Darul Sulah, which means that there are societies with whom Muslims can have a treaty and an, an alliance and a partnership. Uh, and therefore, there are three kinds of arenas in the world where Islam is practiced, where 
Islam is at war with and then Islam is at peace with. But in the Indian context, uh, given the long history of Islam in India and Muslim governance, India remained a very peaceful place when it came to interfaith issues, especially during the time of uh, Emperor Akbar and generally in the time of most of the Mughal emperors, uh, starting with uh, Babur until we reach uh, Aurangzeb. Uh, so what happened was that they <laughs> Muslims felt the need to create another concept called Darul Aman, which is uh, an arena of security and peace. And, and this concept became very profound, especially uh, when Iran was ruled by the Safavids who were trying to convert Iran into a Shia community and uh, Muslims who did not follow the official uh, interpretations of the religion or ideology or politics, were forced to leave uh, Iran and they all migrated to India. And this was during the time of Akbar. And there were people who were facing religious uh, and intellectual persecutions uh, in the Middle East also who migrated to India. And so India became known for its tolerance and acceptance. And so therefore the term Darul Aman became quite uh, important uh, as a description of India. The point that I'm trying to make here is that there is a theological understanding of Islam and there is a lived experience in Islam. While the Darul Aman as a concept cannot be drawn from the theological interpretations. So when you see legalistic discussions of Islam uh, by theologians or Islamic lawyers, they often just talk about Darul Islam, Darul Harb, and maybe Darul Sulah. None of these are Quranic terms, by the way. These are terms that have emerged in Islamic literature over the period of time. And then Darul Aman, which is a consequence of description of the reality that India was, especially under the Mughals uh, and M Emperor Akbar. I will now share with you some ideas of lived uh, Islamic experience uh, in India, uh, especially during the heydays of uh, Islamic governance in India. And these ideas are clearly drawn from, from Islamic uh, values, Islamic principles, some of them anchored directly in the Quran, some from the traditions of Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. Uh, there are just a few of them, uh, and uh, they should give you an idea of the possibility of an insightful and enlightened Islam. Uh, so I have already spoken to you about uh, Darul Aman. One of the things is that uh, people find it surprising and sometimes even uh, criticize the fact that many uh, Muslim rulers of India treated uh, Hindu minority, Hindu majority, actually India was nearly 95% Hindu, when Muslims came and governed India in the, in the beginning of uh, the second millennium. Uh, they treated Hindus as, uh, as dhimis, and so there's a lot of criticism now when Islam and Muslims are being demonized. But in order to treat Muslims, uh, Hindus as dhimis, they had to recognize Hinduism as a religion and as Hindus as people who are of the book as Ahl al-Kitab because primarily dhimis were given the status of Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, and so the fact that many Muslim uh, dynasties uh, Pro provided this protectionist uh, status uh, to, to Hindus uh, indicated that uh, Hindus are Ahl al-Kitab. Now there are very interesting uh, con uh, implications uh, for Hindus as Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, there was uh, a very recent scholar called Humayun Kabir who also made a systematic argument about how Hindus should be treated as Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, but it tells you that uh, there is, was a genuine struggle uh, in India for a long time to find common ground with other religious communities. Not just common ground in terms of culture and language. We already know about the Ganga Jamna Tehzeeb, uh, the mu shared music, shared poetry, uh, shared cultural practices, uh, but also to find uh, room for the other in the theology of Islam. That is an important part, uh, that's the important point that I want you to take, that Muslim scholars struggle. So for example, in today in the US, for many years, uh, American Muslims have uh, struggled to redefine America 
from a Judeo-Christian country to an Abrahamic nation to such an extent that uh, a lot of people now use the word Abrahamic and uh, so you have the Abrahamic Accords. Uh, it is an acknowledgement that Muslims, Jews and Christians share a, a, a common theological and religious and spiritual heritage. But what it does is uh, it excludes Hindus and Buddhists and others. So t we are struggling to find a, a similar concept which would be very inclusive of other faiths. And so you can see that uh, this attempt to, to label or treat Hindus as people of the book was an attempt by Muslim scholars uh, to include Hindus in the same tradition, monotheistic tradition, uh, or, or Abrahamic tradition that uh, was the, under the rubric of people of the book. Under the period of uh, Akbar, Akbar had a, you could argue, a grand strategy called Suleh Kul, uh, universal peace or peace with all. Uh, and uh, that completely and fundamentally contradicted the the theological position taken by the conservative ulama of his time who essentially <laughs> insisted that Muslim sh rulers should invite Hindus to convert to Islam or die. Basically, that was the option. And in to contradict that, he advanced this idea of Suleh Kul and tried to anchor that uh, again in Islamic theology with the help of essentially Sufi interpretations of Islam, where Sufis saw everybody as essentially a potential devotee of God. Uh, and so given the common uh, emerging uh, spiritual traditions of the Bhakti and Sufi traditions in India, it became much more easier to, to nurture a multicultural, multi religious uh, society, uh, essentially a pluralistic society. It became easy for Akbar to create the kind of society that American Muslims want in America and Indian Muslims want in India. Today, Indian Muslims want a Suleh Kul in India. They want India which is pluralistic, India which is inclusive, India which allows everybody to practice their religion and accepts everybody's theological and moral virtue and worth, that is what Indian Muslims today want in India. And that is what Suleh Kul was, was essentially about. So Akbar offered to Hindus what Muslims today want Narendra Modi and RSS and Hindu majority to offer to them. Suleh Kul was Akbar's way of generating pluralism. And of course, we also know that he came up with this idea of Deen Elahi as a religion. The word Deen Elahi was actually never used by him. He used predominantly the concept of Tawheed Elahi, uh, that is oneness of divinity. And the idea of oneness of divinity essentially meant that all religions have the same source and ultimately all of us are heading in the same direction. So this unity of divinity is what he was advocating as the philosophical and theological underpinning to his policy of universal peace. Uh, it is very interesting <laughs> that subsequently uh, we find that uh, Abul Kalam Azad, uh, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, in his interpretation of the Quran, uh, comes up with this concept of Wahdat al Deen. Uh, and uh, it is interesting to say that it is no different from the original idea. Uh, which underpin the concept of Suleh Kul, this idea that we are all may have different ways of worshipping God and we may have different interpretations of how to define and describe God, but ultimately all religions are one. Uh, this was a concept uh, that even Malana uh, Azad uh, uh, brought in his commentary of the Quran, which I assume he did not expect uh, non-Muslims to read. So this message was from a Muslim scholar and a Muslim leader to other Muslims about the unity of, of a religion. Uh, religion is an important part of our society. Uh, religion India is a deeply religious country. Uh, we talk about the Middle East as the holy land. Yes, indeed, the Middle East gave two religions which have membership of more than a billion, which is Islam and Christianity. But India, too, gave two religions to the world which have more than a billion population, which is Hinduism and Buddhism. So given that India is the other holy land, it is very important for those of us in the West who have inherited 
uh, the Indian tradition of multiculturalism, religious tolerance, understanding of the other, and the appreciation of the other, to share it with uh, the citizens of the countries that we have embraced and we live in. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.